The title of the workshop is Legal Troubleshooting for Digital Projects. Um, and before I say a few words about myself, I'd like to learn a bit more about you and also test out a polling system that will be necessary for, um, for this workshop. So, can everyone see the screen? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, please visit this website. Um, at this link, you'll be able to, to vote. Uh, like answer the questions that, that will appear on the screen. In case you don't have internet connection, you'll find um, details of one network over there, but it's maximally 15 connections. So use your own internet if you have, um, and you don't try this one. And let's see if it works. And by this question, I just mean that um, uh, that you're not necessarily like part of uh, part of like DeFi uh, DeFi project, um, but if you are like interested in this space, you want to work in this space, um, you are dealing with some problems related to the DeFi space. I don't have. All right, so it's working, right? Does it work for everyone? Yes. Okay, that's great. So let's move to another question to you, which is another type of question. Which area of DeFi is of most interest to you? And here you should be able to type a response. Uh, here we have some examples, right? So that, that will give me a feeling of um, what's of most interest uh, to you guys. Texas seems like the dominated now. Nice. Really cool. Seems like it reflects what's um, what are the most hot, the hottest topics right now. In the really cool. Risk is so small. <laughs> <laughs> No one cares, right? <laughs> <laughs> nice. There are lending. Absolutely. Right. And the last question to you guys. Where are you based? And here, um, I, I rather mean, like, where is your DeFi project based? Right? Or where, where is, like, your, your main interest in, ter in terms of, like, uh, DeFi activity? Um, so even if you you know live in Japan but you're working on the US based deeper project, uh, both on the US. I know that for decentralized projects it might not be so um, so easy, but let let's like give your best guesses here. Okay, here we have counters. It's working for most people. Right, cool. So now a few words about myself. Um, I'm Jacek, but I'm a blockchain fintech lawyer uh, in, in crypto for, for more than five years. And here you have like a few affiliations. Those at the top are the most important ones, I think. So I'm a legal counsel at the Maker Foundation, and also I, I serve um, on some industry bodies and some, and some uh, DeFi focus groups, such as the Multi-Chain Asset Managers Associations, Association in, in Switzerland. I'm a graduate of Oxford, and also I got to Harvard Law School, but my, my assumption was that I wouldn't go there before, before the multi-collateral dice launched. Uh, and it's gonna happen uh, next month, so I will be finally to, to go to Harvard next year. Uh, I'm gonna launch a blog uh, focused on the legal aspects of, of DeFi under, under this um, address as, as soon as I have some time. And also I'm a, I'm a huge Lego fan, so actually the first thing I, I did yesterday was to go to the local Lego store to buy some stuff. And an important disclaimer before we start, um, I am a lawyer, just not your lawyer. 
uh, nothing here is going to be legal advice, at least for me. Uh, are there any other lawyers in the room? All right, quite a few. So you guys are free to you know, give out your legal advice, but nothing what I say is legal advice. And views are my own, right? So I'm not representing, uh, necessarily representing maker views right now or any other organization that, that I'm somewhat guilty with, Lego included. So now troubleshooting uh, of some legal problems. So at first, my idea for this workshop was to present you some very specific problems that I think are relevant for, for DeFi projects, which, like also, which also uh, like follows through my practice. But I thought that like this workshop um, a format is, is um, uh, like it's a, um, it would be a better opportunity for this particular format to actually ask you about some some thoughts that you have on the top. So what's going to happen? I'm going to present you a few more general problems uh, that I see legal problems that I see in the DeFi space, and I'd like you guys to answer uh, like like ask you about your opinions about these problems and also about possible solutions and we can also have some discussion around this. Um, so, any questions at the moment? This is, remember this is a workshop, so I, I'd really like to see some discussion here. Let me present the first one, it's going to be like a test one, uh, that I call front-end liability, uh, which is, it seems, it seems pretty obvious to me, but let me explain in case it, 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 it isn't to some of you. You know, even fully decentralized products in the DeFi space, uh, which are, you know, some smart contract based protocols that are immutable, unstoppable, and so on, they use some centralized frontends to attract users, right? And these centralized frontends are usually some websites, which have, uh, which have some usual domain, centralized hosting, uh, there are some fees connected, um, collected uh, at this frontend level, there is data collection going on, just like everything that you'd expect from some usual, uh, you know, uh, traditional financial services. When you're visited these websites and you're, you're getting some services, you're paying for them, your data has been collected and so on. Uh, and these frontends um, and the operators sometimes may run into legal trouble uh, because they, what they do is they facilitate access to, to financial services and products. Um, and I have one specific example. I was trying to provide examples to each of the problems that I'm presenting. You probably know this, this website, InterDelta, and you probably know that they, um, they, were, they were hit by, by some enforcement action in the US. And when you look at the content of, of their settlement, uh, it's quite striking that the SEC, the American SEC, it recognizes the, the difference between the protocol level and the frontend level. Yet in the in the practice, in the practice, it's 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 like it's it's really difficult to 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 differently analyze both, right? And it's clear from the language that they're using, right? That they, they mentioned it a few times that the, the website, the Interdelta website, had few features similar to online securities trading platforms, right? And they, they actually listed these features, right? They are displaying the orders, they're sorted by price and color. Um, there, there is uh, user account information, uh, provided fields to input deposit, withdrawal, and so on, right? They provide all of this information and said, this looks like exchange, right? This looks like securities trading venue. There is no difference from the user perspective. And of course, we all know that there is a certain smart contract going on in the background. Perhaps EtherDelta is not the best like, example of like a totally decentralized product but yet. You can see that, especially if there is just a single frontend to, to the protocol, which is very often the case in, in the DeFi space, there is a certain problem that from the regulator, regulator's perspective, it, they will not see it differently than any other centralized products. Any questions to these problems, to this problem, before we get to my questions to you guys? Go ahead. So since the frontend liability will only provide the like just a, a centralized uh, point of entry, couldn't uh, isn't the fact that anyone could make a front end for it remove that liability, or does that is that not affected because there is one sort of official front end? So one reservation from from my side. Uh, that, that's a good question. I'm not talking about in like any specific regulatory specific regulatory regime, right? I'm trying to like abstract away certain problems, uh, and all of them I think would be would be relevant in many jurisdictions around the globe, right? So 
of course, like answer to this type of question might be different in, in, in some in some places. I'm just I'm just talking about a certain practice, right? That very often this uh, these protocols have single frontends, right? And of course, uh, this is uh, this is this is a very good advice that that I'm also giving out. Uh, something is that you need to like make this difference between protocol layer and frontend layer, right? So that so that. Um, you focus your, your efforts on the protocol layer only, but you know from, from the strictly business perspective, it's just difficult, right? It's just difficult to encourage people to build something on their protocol, and it's just difficult to build a business model on your protocol so right? So that's why people want to bootstrap this activity, they want to earn money on this, they will they, they are building these frontends, right? Which which might get them some, some regulatory troubles. And actually I have a second example uh, which is not something that like Good. So question on that. Um, how do you think about uh, actual traffic? So there might be different front ends, um, but would the regulators look at that and say 90% of the traffic is going mm -hmm. through a specific one? They want to make the distinction? Again, it's it's difficult to answer this question like without any context, right? But I think it's uh, like I think it's it's gonna be relevant. Like no matter what's what's that like a precise legal rule or its interpretation, if that's clear that you know you are providing a certain financial service via this certain frontend, and you are like using this like claims about decentralization, smart contract based protocol, some other frontends. This is not gonna work if, like, functionally and practically, this service is mostly available via this single frontend, which does not make it different from any centralized services, right? Uh, and the second example is about you probably heard about like the recent uh, FAT AML recommendations. This is a kind of like a global AML regulatory uh, intergovernmental body. They are setting some certain standards, and recently. They they apply like they, they, they came up with a new recommendation uh, that is very relevant for crypto, and so far the interpretations like all of this is going to be implemented in some in, in all of the countries, right? So this is like a inter, like international level, let's say. Um, and so far the interpretations are quite positive, right? So they recognize that they seem to recognize that if there is a certain service that is decentralized, and especially non-custodial, the AML requirements should not apply, right? But we'll see how this how this work, work works out in, in, in many countries. And I can see I can clearly um, see that in some places the interpretation might be different, right? So actually something uh, that is providing, you know, even if it's not custodial, but it's providing like virtually the same service and as some centralized products, uh, it's gonna be subject to AML requirements, which is of course like difficult, right? Because you know there's nothing like AML. I'm aware of like AML at the protocol level. You need to apply AML at the frontend level, and then you know you end up in a situation in which this protocol is not so relevant anymore because. You know, you need a certain front-end operator to use these services. So now, uh, some questions to you guys uh, that I'm really curious about. This is the first one. Front-end liability, so the problem that I just presented. Have you considered this problem before, right? So in, I know that my majority of you are working on DeFi projects, and now the question is, did you consider this when working on your, on your products? Does it work for everyone? This this polling solution? Yeah. Okay. That's All right. That's interesting. So there is there is some acknowledgement of this of this problem. It would be great to have some discussion, but let let's postpone it until my last question. Um, the second question is how. Relevant is this issue for your project, the one you are working on? Is this something you think that it's you know you, you have considered this, but is it relevant for your particular project? That's like this result is a certain confirmation of the fact that it's. Um, like large majority is saying, of you saying that it's relevant. It's a certain confirmation that it's a certain problem in the DeFi space right now. That that you actually people are actually building these frontends um, 
uh, on top of their of their protocols. Uh, and there is uh, like there is a second level. Of course, I'm not you know this is not to scare you off, right? These problems that are presenting these are just issues that I think we we should like spread knowledge about them. Also, uh, in order to educate regulators and lawmakers about these problems, right? Because sometimes these people are are just not aware that there is this split between pro sometimes like quite obvious to us, but not to them, this split between protocol and protocol. And now, more general question, how relevant is this for the entire DeFi space, in your opinion? Key question, basically if everyone's finished with this one, what's the best solution? So initially I was planning this as like myself proposing some solutions to you guys, but I'm very, very curious about, about your solution. So here we can propose, I think, two, um, two solutions and then upvote or downvote uh, solutions provided by some other people. Remember about upvoting and downvoting. This will give us a feeling of what, what, what people actually support. Start a new country. <laughs> So it seems to me, uh, it seems like multiple frontends is um, is the winning option. Yet uh, look that like IPFS appears in at least three others, right? So that's uh, that's certainly a solution that also came to my mind, and it's like people are saying about this uh, for a long time. Does anyone uh, any like a proponent of this idea um, know like what's the state? like actually being able to decentralize uh, both hosting and domains? Does, is anyone aware of, because like everyone knows that it's possible, right? But I haven't seen anything like that in practice. I would say the state is that, um, I, like, the, the, the problem is the DNS end, right? You, you, can, you can use um, ENS or something. Mm -hmm. And I think now like MetaMask will, handle getting you to that domain, I may be wrong, but the problem is that's not widely supported. So in the end, you, if you want anybody to just be able to access your website, mm -hmm. um, yeah. you, need some, you need something somewhere for basically anyone except the most already technologically committed to be able to do it. Yeah. Because that's definitely, it. Like, definitely like this tech, technological solution for the problem, right? So just like frontends are a problem because they are centralized. So let's decentralize frontends would be, would be probably a very good solution, right? But like, the fact that it's not does not exist in practice, uh, like like I like at least my conclusion is that it's not ready for for, for like it's, it does not exist right. It's a, it's a cool solution that is not available right now. Uh, multiple frontends. Uh, that's 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 a really cool idea that it's like in, in at least two options as well. 
Uh, it's just like, does anyone want to uh, share experience on that one? Well, I just have a question mm -hmm. regarding that one, and it maybe goes back to like using the Ether Delta as an example. Because mm -hmm. um, I don't exactly see how the full front end solves the problem. Like, with the Ether, Ether Delta case, if I have been the one to implement that front end mm -hmm. on their protocol, like, would I have been the one receiving the, um, you know, SEC prosecution, mm -hmm. or is it Ether Delta? Mm -hmm. If you have multiple front ends, are you just like, Diversifying the number of people that can end up getting uh, mm -hmm. prosecuted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that of course it's it's uh, it wouldn't be like a, like a super suit. I mean, by doing this, you are just underlining the fact that that the front end layer is like separate from the protocol layer, right? So you can you can you can like the, the part of the legal strategy here that, that I'm seeing from time to time is to say, okay, there might be some regulated activities going on in there, but they are not happening on the front end layer. We are just like providing this information that are uh, happening on the protocol layer. Try regulate protocols, not the front end operators. This is at the core of this strategy. Does anyone want to like have an experience with this, like building a decentralized product and trying to actually bootstrap multi front end support? Because for some reason, it's not happening very often as well, right? Like I, I already, I already said at the beginning that my feeling is that it's just difficult from the business perspective, right? To, to encourage people to, 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 to do this, uh, but if uh, there's something else, good. I mean, I, my experience is talking about regulators, they focus on what the spirit of the law, and so mm -hmm. if you're enabling people, mm -hmm. like that's an issue, so I can't mm -hmm. do these mm -hmm. Just enabling an activity which they mm -hmm. deem to be illegal, and so they're going to go after whoever is enabling that. Mm -hmm. So multiple front ends, from my perspective, doesn't solve anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just to add to that, I think that yeah, my experience with regulators is similar, but I think that the uh, multiple front ends thing, it's not really, you can't go to a regulator and say, mm -hmm. listen, look, there's another front end, let me off. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of argument you make to a judge in an extremely legal argument saying, mm -hmm. because of this, and it's a little more complicated than that, but because of this technicality, let me off. Mm -hmm. so you won't get a regulator off your back. If mm -hmm. you want to come for you, they come for you. Yeah, that's true. I think that we, we need to think about this uh, together with this solution, full decouple protocol and front end, right? This is like a, like the first step that needs to be done in order to, to this one, like, uh, making any sense. And it's like, in terms of bootstrapping those multiple products, how do you incentivize someone to you know, exactly. create a front end, yeah. right? Because it feels like it's not clear that just creating a front end on top of this protocol, I'm not actually just shouldering a bunch of that regulatory risk. So like, my incentivization is gonna have to be pretty strong to uh, you know, wade into those waters of potentially creating that liability for myself for a protocol that I didn't need to get. Right? Mm -hmm. Also, if you don't have some sort of really consistent and, and sustainable business model, then these projects become harder and harder to mm -hmm. be able to properly you know, mm -hmm. sustain and expand themselves. Mm -hmm. Especially with the legal risk associated with most DeFi projects, that gets very expensive very quickly. Yeah. Yesterday, if you attended the Bruins um, uh, Maker CEO speech, you, know, you, could, you could see like, but like his hint at, at, at part of our strategy. I mean, like approach or ideal approach, which is regulated on edges, right? And uh, like in the same way as Bitcoin or Ethereum, so, like no one is trying to regulate what's happening in these networks. Yet there is there is certain regulation on, on edges, such as exchanges, right? This is uh, like a certain strategy that uh, that many people are trying to convince regulators to, so that you know they they like live it, like live this decentralized decentralized part like alone and try to regulate all what's, all what's around. But of course, you know, like it's it's for them it's it's difficult to accept something like this, right? To allow that certain, you know, regulated activity is just being you know transferred to some protocol layer, and that's why I think that um, it's not um, it's not here on the list. But I, I could see it on on the phone that there was another option change and change the law, right? Like no one knows like how exactly, but that's a, that's a certain option as well, right? Perhaps this law doesn't work anymore in this context, right? Uh, we, we see, like, the, like, this is, like, for us, it's, it's obvious how can you regulate this thing, right? You can regulate this front end, you can, you know, put these guys to jail, but this protocol still exists, right? This is, like, immutable as the blockchain itself, if, if the contract, smart contract is built in this way. Right, any other comments on, on some other solutions here? Ah, right, we have this one. Try to influence and change regulation. This, this one. Yeah. What do you think about the video? 
Uh, yeah, it's, it's an interesting one. In practice, is there anyone from Gnosis here? Because in, in practice, this is being followed by them, right? They, they established this DXDAO, which is, which is governing Dutch's, Dutch, Dutch's um, uh, DEX. Uh, right, they're, they're trying this this out in practice so that so that these guys are actually, actually controlling controlling the decks. Um, I mean, interesting, but like outside of this example, I haven't seen this in practice. Right, the question is if that's uh, if you if you have uh, like the question is if you really can have like uh, centralized hosting owned by DAO. Right, this is this is this is still open. Right. Uh, there is a certain risk that at least some jurisdiction this DAO would be would be just classified as a certain partnership or association or something, right? Which would not protect its 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 members or whoever from, from liability. Right, but let's let's move to other problems because there are six of them and we are just uh, at number one. So the second one I call decentralization. Uh, and the problem is is uh, again simple I think, which is that Decentralized financial products are often partially centralized, and this I think is, is quite obvious to to many people in this space. There are just examples of of, of these centralization spots. There is also sometimes lack of transparency, right? So that people are actually not aware, or they don't know what's centralized and what's decentralized, right? There is like certain marketing about about decentralized financial services. Yet when people look closer. Um, uh, sometimes it's, it's just clear that just some parts are decentralized or there are some centralized elements and I think DEX is, is, is the best example of this, right? right? So that people for, for business reasons are, are like, you know, incorporating some centralization in their services so that it's more like, you know, it's faster, it's more, um, uh, it, it's best, better for reusers uh, because, I don't know, um, uh, it, it provides them the better service. And this why is it important? This undermines the core legal claim of many DeFi projects, right? Because many projects, like, like talking about like totally high level legal strategy, they're saying this is completely decentralized, right? I'm not controlling it. So how how would I be like? Why would I be uh, respons responsible for this if I'm not running this? Yet it seems that there are sometimes there are some operators or people with keys that can do something. And again, example, um, like Compound was, last month Compound was like, there was such a spotlight on this project due to there's some centralized features, which is not necessarily like a, like a accusation or anything against Compound because they are, uh, at least to my knowledge, they, they're writing this quite openly in their white paper that it, it has like this centralized functionalities with like this ultimate goal Towards towards uh, towards full decentralization, right? But that's the reality of many DeFi projects, right? That they, due to like many reasons, also like lack of you know like under under like lack of sufficient development of technology, they are they are implementing decentralized features, and but still this, this may undermine this uh, this legal strategy. So now questions, uh, and this will be the same one. Did you consider this problem before? in the legal terms? How does it affect you on the legal? Right. Uh, I just I just explain uh, decentralization by itself is very often like a legal problem, right? Don't regulate this product. This is central. This is decentralized, right? So there is no one to regulate. Yet in many cases you actually see that there is someone behind, right? Even for example, even if like this is non-custodial. Uh, there is someone who is controlling price fits, which effectively gives a lot of control over over the product, right? So they can come for you for using a, a control. It just undermines this very claim that there is no one behind it, right? So that it's running on its own. It's like completely decentralized, like a Bitcoin, right? Right. So quite a big awareness of this one. Let's move to the second question, which is how relevant is this issue for your project? Right. Does anyone uh, want to um, openly say 
which project they are representing and why they, they are choosing one of the options. Go ahead. Yeah, so I'm with Topo Finance. We do optimize interest rates across compound DYDX and Fulcrum. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think, you know, from our perspective, one, we're like, we're literally launching today, so we're super new. And like, obviously, um, we've seen generally it's really hard to like launch straight fully decentralized, right? It's mm -hmm. more of a process that mm -hmm. we work on over time. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the ways that we're thinking about it is like trying to make sure we're decentralized like in the direct areas in which case in mm -hmm. which we're like maybe running a little bit into a gray area mm -hmm. in terms of regulation right so i'm interested to hear kind of your perspective on that of like you know <laughs> custodianship for example i mean not mm -hmm. totally unrelated to topo custodianship is um you know an element of centralization but it's also like you can be compliant with regula regulation in that capacity mm -hmm. but then like these other elements where you're maybe a little mm -hmm. you know less compliant mm -hmm. with standard regulation those are the areas that you uh, focus on your decentralization yeah that that's a good point and that's that's absolutely true that like again i'm trying to present like extremely general problems so that they like people might think about that like no matter from what country they're coming and what, what they're actually doing but of course uh this is like this this highly highly depends on context right so your your you know your certain decentralization centralization balance might result might you know the result might be that you are subject to AML requirements in a certain jurisdictions but not to security training requirements right um, that really depends of course you need to like very carefully look into like specifics and also specific regulation in the given country in order to come up with with like precise answer like here like out of necessity we need to to, to stay on this on this high level um, uh, later Okay, next question. How relevant is this issue for the entire DeFi space? Right. Seems like a pretty straightforward answer. Okay. And the last one, solutions. Any ideas of how to? I know that it's extremely general, uh, but at the same time, I see this problem being repeated in many contexts. Any solutions to this one? Does anyone want to say what they understand by gradual decentralization? I didn't put it, but what I assume they mean is that you, you uh, sort of uh, either do smart contracts of upgradability or some proxy, sort of proxy contracts you can do. Do you start out at a point where you are fairly centralized, so you mm -hmm. have maybe southern oracles or like maybe some databases, maybe some IP path hashes? And then as you, and then through multiple stages, multiple sprints, you sort of design the architecture of the applications, mm -hmm. more contracts, so you need more and more decentralized. So less mm -hmm. reliance on um, centralized points of data, mm -hmm. black boxes, or other work. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I assume, if somebody wants to contradict me. I just want to add one more thing to that. Mm -hmm. It's also important to be careful about token allocations and governance, and make sure that over time, at least, mm -hmm. token allocations become more Certainly, if, there, if, if a token is a part of a certain project, yeah. certainly that's the case. And I think transparency is a really good point. It's, it's, it's getting a lot of votes as well, right? This is not like a solution per se, um, but at least, you know, it's, it, it really delivers a lot of value uh, you know, towards your users and potential, potential interested regulators as well, so that you're transparent in what you're doing. Um, right, awareness is, is possibly about the same. Right, let's move on. So the third problem is about integrated income and finance, uh, which is not only a legal problem, I think. Um, 
but, but, but also. Uh, so one example is that um, these are like, uh, from, from the legal and institutional perspective, these are two completely different worlds, right? And one specific example of that is that in DeFi or like blockchain in general, we are mostly talking about uh, bearer assets, right? Like Bitcoin, so that you know you own, you own the keys, you own the assets, right? And that's all. You are you are the there is like no custody, there is like no no other party here. Uh, in traditional finance, this is about almost all about registered assets. So so that your asset is actually a claim against someone, and sometimes it's really complicated who the other, who this other person is. Um, that is like somehow obligated towards you, right? If you're holding like a stock, like most of the countries uh, in the world, you're actually not, like you're not having this, like you're having this, this claim against the company, but actually there is a certain custodian, there is a certain broker that is, that is you know, uh, actually holding this legal right. Uh, and this is just an example, right? Uh, we all know that, you know, DeFi is, is mostly about building things that are permissionless in traditional finance by their definition, uh, these are permission solutions, right? That are based on some or some trusted parties and essential counterparties. Uh, and now, example uh, at Maker, we actually had this this discussion in, in the community recently about MCD and non-trustless or, or permission, as I as I call it, assets in MCD, right? How would it play out, and how exactly can we combine like this permission nature of many assets? With the permissionless um, uh, uh, nature of, 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 of the whole product of MCD and, and the maker system, uh, and this is you know the, the, that sounds extremely general, but there are very practical questions about it, right? Like how do you how do you you know answer this question? What will happen if certain asset that is held as collateral is frozen, right? Or the uh, force transfer function is used, right? These are, these are also technical problems, not to mention that they're legal ones, right? Because what does it mean to, to stop something and who's holding this asset once it, it is in a, in a permissionless network? Um, so that's, that's a very specific problem because that's not necessarily a problem, regulatory problem, right? That, like, as, as the, the, the other ones that we're talking about, that there is a certain risk that us as, like, defined project creators might be held to, to liability. This is a strictly legal problem that we have um, because we, 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 we somehow want these real world assets to be, to, be, to be brought into the DeFi space, yet we are facing, facing this, uh, these problems. And this is also not, a, not just about assets, but also integrating with the traditional finan financial infrastructure, right? So for example, bringing DeFi assets into traditional finance, this is the same problem, right? How to bring permissionless assets into a permission environment. There we go with questions. Did you consider this this problem? It might not be totally relevant for some projects. For some other, it is extremely relevant. Perfect split. So let's see if you guys think it's relevant for you. Also, a legal problem in a way that this is how regulation is built, right? Like, financial laws are a response to how financial system works, and it works in a permission permission manner, right? This is this is perhaps the, the like the source the source of the of the, of the problem. And how relevant it is for the entire DeFi space? Of course, it, it depends on the perspective, right? Because if people um, are thinking about DeFi as like completely something completely alternative towards the traditional financial financial system, perhaps it's not relevant at all. But those that think about like integration and converging those theories, it is it is probably super relevant. Let me speed up a bit. 
solutions. It seems that friendly jurisdictions are getting a lot of votes, both up and down votes. So regulate on the edges, which is a winning option here, is, is a nice one. Um, yet it, it's it's um, it's it's not a solution in a way that um, there's not something that we can apply, right? <laughs> because we are not regulating. But of course, I mean, one thing that that is uh, becoming more and more obvious to me is that we, as like the DeFi movement, need to like engage in these regulatory discussions. Um, Right now, it seems that certain momentum is building, especially in the stablecoin space with Libra approaching. And we need to build this awareness, right? How DeFi projects are different from all the other uh, that might also function in the, like crypto, crypto space, yet they are, they are completely different. So yeah, uh, so here, uh, I think that the majority of us is saying that uh, change the law, uh, regulate on the edges, which is like convince regulators or lock markets to, to, to regulate on the edges. And sandbox facilities, or to convince them to build sandboxes, is the winning option. And that's, that's something I agree with in a way that I, um, I think that's, that's what we need to do, right? Just, just to, just to um, try to, um, to, to impact how, how the law is functioning currently. Right, next problem. Uh, which is which is uh, very simple. Uh, DeFi is global, right? This is like by again by very definition something that sh like you know people can use like whenever they want, when, whenever and wherever they want. Uh, yet regulation is local, right? Like you are facing co sometimes uh, completely different problems in, in many jurisdictions. Sometimes not completely different, yet these details are are of, of utmost importance. And I have. Uh, now it's not an example; it's a counter example, <laughs> because that's that's what we are pursuing as well. We, you know, we are facing this problem as well, right? The DAI might be, uh, and right now I'm like I'm wearing this gloves so of make representative. DAI might be treated in many countries differently, right? As as uh, like uh, uh, money as a financial instrument, as, as something else, right? Depending on the local laws. Yet we are trying to do our best, uh, sometimes in regulatory dialogue as well. To uh, to protect this free status of dig of digital cash, right? Of like a spot instrument that is not regulated. It's 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 just not a regulated instrument. So far, we are going uh, good, 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 good job here. But you know the problem remains, right? That this these product services might be regulated differently, and it's difficult for us to, to respond to that, right? Because you know we are building something that that is global. Did you consider this problem? Before? And by the way, this data, I'm, I'm going to share it, of course. Uh, I hope that, that this tool is, is giving the option to, to save all of this. Of course, all of this is completely anonymous, right? But um, it's going to be very useful, I think, and interesting to see this disaggregated data and present it to the wider community. Uh, yes, I have a question. Mm -hmm. So, you know, global compliance sounds like, yes, it might be a problem, but it also sounds like it could be a way to create mm -hmm. a solution, right? Mm -hmm. Like, uh, there could be global standards around uh, you know, globally uh, wild financial mm -hmm. things, right? 
is that do you know the current state of uh, any like global standards around maybe like the most uh, prevalent things? That are we're not. We're like a million miles from that. Yeah, yeah we I figure. Yeah. Just because uh, there is even just between the United States and China and like, the, the European Union and then some other like uh, Southeast Asia, there's just so many widely different ways of run their economies and their just their entire structure where. We mean YouTube, for example, and Netflix all have to completely map around the way they, they contribute, form, organize media. Even something like blockchain, something like DeFi, it would be an absolute fast to get them into the same table, let alone agree on a set of yeah. financial assets and regulation. That's true. Uh, but actually, I devoted uh, my talk at the DeFi Summit in London uh, last month exactly to the topic, like 30 minutes exactly to that. So I encourage everyone to, to have a look if you're interested. This is also interesting because sometimes it's just, you know, people are just saying, hey, we are not we are not available or operating in any specific country. We are available globally, but that means that no specific laws apply to us, right? Because we are not present specifically in any country. So that forms some, some that's a strategy for some people as well. Right, how relevant is that for your project? So rel related to the question of uh, like global compliance standards, mm -hmm. who would be the kind of uh, the multinational regulatory body to watch? <laughs> there's there's nothing like that, but there are, okay. there's something what is called standard setting bodies, okay. which are not necessarily regulators in terms they are not able to adopt uh, binding rules, but they are developing standard standards and encouraging others to adopt them. Right? Is that like IMF? Uh, it's uh, like uh, PCI standard or something. Uh, FAT is an example, FAT, okay. right? FAT yeah. in AML space. There's IOSCO in um, in the security security space and a few others, right? And they These are, are like think tanks that are producing. Yeah, I mean, regulations. you know, actual regulators are participating. Countries are participating in these bodies, right? Yeah. So they're not like just think tanks. Uh, yeah. uh, and they they are like as an example of FAT shows. They are extremely relevant. Yeah. How relevant is for is it for the entire DeFi space? Quite a bit. And as I said, this is this is you know uh, the current stage at least. It's not necessarily like a bad thing, right? Although uh, always. So it's, it's like a certain legal issue, but not necessarily a problem. Right, so what's the best solution? Yeah, and that, that's what I mentioned earlier, that it's not necessarily a problem, right? Um, and global standards, yes, definitely, definitely an interesting one. Yet, uh, they, they might be, at least in some, like AML for example, that's something that might be some close to, to global coordination, that, that's happening already. Some other uh, things like security regulation, this is gonna, this is gonna be probably yeah. impossible to, to get coordination. Uh, one interesting example is the approach to stablecoins with Libra approaching and all of this, you know, mass uh, people from like central bankers from various countries saying that they're not gonna allow this. 
this, this will be a very interesting test for international coordination. Are, are all the major uh, economies actually able to, to coordinate on this matter? This one, I'm, I'm the one who said it's not a problem, mm -hmm. it's an opportunity. I find it interesting that the top two options are literally opposite of each other. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. But I think people underestimate how difficult it is if you have global standards that you don't like. You, you basically start having to go, I won't say underground, but you start having to play in the spaces between the regulation, the oh, is it implemented a bit differently here, is it done a bit differently mm -hmm. here? That sort of thing is great for lawyers, but not for people who want to build projects. And you know, these standards exist, like these laws are more or less similar in many countries because the policy concerns are the same or, or almost identical, right? So there, there are certain, certain standards, the question is if these are not detail, details which are problematic here, right? When you come from a country that has like bad regulation, mm -hmm. Pretty much, you don't care about. Like, for regulation. example, yeah. for example, on Honduras, mm -hmm. you have like a lot of problems and corruption and everything. Mm -hmm. So, pretty much, you just, you just don't care. So, it's better just to disrupt. So, that's the thing that it works. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Disrupt this. Uh, is there a difference between global standards of regulation and global standards of definition about? Various things like maybe like for example definition of dye mm -hmm. is dye a bearer acid is it not is dye a security is it not mm -hmm. uh, is there like I don't know the, the what, like how the world works with definitions versus mm -hmm. regulations no that's that's more more or less the same I'd say, well, right same. like for AML regulation for AML um, for the purpose of AML work at, at FAT it was like extremely relevant how virtual currency is defined right yeah. that that was like one of the core problems. Right, let's let's run this really quickly. Developer liability. I'm not sure if that requires <laughs> any explanation here. Just one example, because there was like a lot of like theoretical thoughts about this, but one example, AML laws are being implemented by many countries in Europe right now. Uh, and this is this is something that the the the, the UK government like proposed. Like they asked the question, would it make sense to apply this regulation to people that are dealing with the publication of open source software, which includes but is not limited to non-custodian wallet software and other types of crypto related software, right? So this would be not just banks or crypto exchanges that would be subject to this type of regulation, but also open source devs. Did you consider this problem before? That's, that's actually quite surprising. I thought it would be it would be close to 100 percent yes. But let's move on. How relevant is this issue for your project? I mean, it's of course difficult to say, right? If you're not a lawyer, uh, but just your 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 feeling about this. People are afraid to answer. Not not relevant, right? How relevant it is for the entire DeFi space. The reason again is is that you know if you have like decentralized financial services and regulators are looking for something that is called access points. You know you may want to address users, miners, but developers like people that are actually doing this shit. Uh, and not only developing protocols, but also front-ends seem, seem like an obvious license. But from the regulatory cost point of view, do you think regulators will run after these developers? Because that includes a huge amount of cost for the mm -hmm. regulators. Yeah. I mean, again, this is like a general problem that might materialize in some specific <coughs> context, right? Mm -hmm. uh, of course, I, I do not foresee this, this world in which developers would need to go underground because there would be like huge regulatory enforcement action at, at all of you guys, right? Uh, but in some context that might be relevant, like I, like I showed with the same levels, right? It, it, it's enough if there is like this small detail that, that would really make a difference, like, right? Right. Solutions? Actually, I think that here, that here the best solution would be to um, to uh,
not that way. Anonymous deaths, dark deaths. <laughs> You know, it, it's not that sometimes we may, we may think that it's like without any sense at all, right? But, you know, imagine like a dev that is just developing a Ponzi scheme, like with full knowledge that it's going to serve this purpose with deploying the code and promoting the code, right? That, that's, that's not obvious, right? Uh, whether we might want to go after this guy or not. That there is a certain rationale for doing this, right? We're fine. But what is the definition of a developer over here? If it's an open source and everybody can contribute, yeah, so it's a community it, of that's people, true. Right? Yes, that's true. Right. Okay. So we are really running out of time. So let's quickly go through the last piece, which is just like pure legal partners, right? So some some cases in which you might want to do something that is uh, that like do this legally, you just can't. And two examples. The first one. It's just, in the EU, it's just impossible to beat a regulated tax right now. Due to some legal requirements, this is like the precise provision. We don't have time to elaborate on this. And this, I never want to say it, because I, I avoid it at, at, at all costs to, to just mention this. But this is, this is another problem, right? It, it actually stops a lot of blockchain projects, because people don't know how to, how to deal with this. Right? So, last series of questions. Legal barriers, so, you know, like, like you know, laws that are just not responding well to, to these new, new products. Which does not mean that, you know, sometimes the fact that they are not covering something explicitly is not a problem, it's, it's rather an opportunity, but sometimes they are stopping people from doing, doing things legally. Not sure how many answers that have, but it seems like how relevant is this for your project? Right. Sometimes people overestimate this uh, because they have a certain bad feelings about the law in general. But this is uh, this is a real problem. Very often. How is this relevant for the whole DeFi space? It seems that this one actually had a little. This one actually had like a very simple, uh, simple solution, right? Just change the law, just uh, just make these people that are responsible responsible for this aware of these problems, which is which is possibly the the best result. It's sometimes the question is if we want to do that, right? Especially those people that have this mindset of building something that is completely alternative. Uh, you know, they just don't want to make people aware that regulators, right? Because they think that it's going to bring some problems, and it's it's a valid it's a valid point. Cool. So there is a win option. All right. So we are uh, we are radically um, late. I think that time up. <laughs> this is the card. So uh, thank you very much. I'm gonna use this data. Uh, hopefully on defi.law blog uh, and present present these ideas and I hope like I really hope that this this will be just like the initial discussion about general problems and we'll get into specifics as a community right because we really need to share these problems 
uh, common problems, as we can see, as, as projects and, and, and think about solutions that would apply to everyone. Can you just mention the left two ones, just to, to begin research on or no? Uh, there were eight, right? Eight, eight problems. Or no, six. Oh, okay. Sorry, if I, that, that was my mistake. I said uh, eight. These were six problems, so that's actually the variant. Thanks.